Hello everyone, welcome back to the analyst for 6th of November 2023 where we will be trying to understand the most important articles from today's The Hindu and The Indian Express. So looking at the topics that we will cover today, the very first is the national security strategy that is going on the news right now. Next we will be trying to look at the significance of the visit of the Bhutan king in India. Next we will be looking at what are freebies and why it is right now in the news. And finally, we'll be going to discuss two prelims articles. First is about the Commission for Air Quality Management. And next, we'll be trying to wrap up the session with the price rise in onions right now. Now, as always, before starting the article, I want to tell you that the handout for this discussion is available in the description below. So do definitely check it out. Now, the very first article is discussing about the national security strategy. Now, here, Years after deliberations in the military and the strategic community, India has now formally kick-started or you know just begun the process of bringing in the national security strategy. Now why this is so important because in GS3 we have internet security and also we have various security forces and agencies and their mandate. So we need to study about this development in a very explained manner. Now see, let us look at the background initially. Uh, in India, we have something known as the National Security Council that was established in 1998, which does what? Which actually advises the Prime Minister's office on national security aspects. So all aspects related to national security is advised by the National Security Council or the Prime Minister's office. And here, the National Security Advisor is presiding over this NSC. Right now, we have the National Security Advisor as, the, uh, as Ajit Doval, who was a former IPS officer. And here, we have a hierarchy also of the National Security Management in India. Now, in a table fam format, let us understand what is the hierarchy. At the very top, we have the National Security Council, as discussed. It will be coordinating all the national security policies with reference to military and security, national security at the national level. So it is at the apex, it is the number one agency. And here it has its own secretariat. It is known as the National Security Council Secretariat. It does what? It looks into all of the aspects and various dimensions of India, such as political dimensions, economic, energy and strategic security concerns. So it will be looking and advising and studying, analyzing each and every aspects of this. And it has four verticals. Remember, we are still talking about the National Security Council and its secretariat. It will be having four uh, verticals. The very first vertical is strategic planning, internal affairs, intelligence and technology and military. So we can understand this is a very, very important secretariat when it comes to the internal security and also the overall security of India. In the next line, we have the strategic policy group, which will be providing what strategic policy to, to the NSC and also it will be the implementing body. So whatever the, uh, you know, security imperatives that the National Security Council will be doing, it will be implementing them. So strategic policy group will be implementing the national security decisions. And finally, at the end, we also have the National Security Advisory Board. It will be doing what it will be actually composed of various experts and policy makers who will be giving expert advice to the NSC. And they will be also undertaking long term R&D, long term research and development on the various national security issues. So we can understand this is the overall one, two and three tires of national security management in India. And additionally, it, this additional, uh, you know, uh, three tire has also a secretariat from the Joint Intelligence Committee. Now this intelligence committee from the very what we can understand is consisting of the various intels or intelligence that we get from both internal and external sources that can be from the both IB and the raw. So this is the overall background that we need to know. And here the national security strategy document is actually a document which is released by the National Security Council Secretariat. Now this document is a very very important one. Why? Because it will be delineating all the security objectives in India. Now what kind of security, security objectives it has, it will be clearly defining when it is out in the public domain. It is not still out there, but when it will be out, it will be clearly de defining four characteristics. The very first is the 
traditional threats that India is facing. Then the non-traditional threats India is facing, the opportunities that India have in its national security uh, you know, aspirations and also the accountability of the various agencies. Now let us discuss these all in detail. Now see, the very first is about combating the traditional threats. Traditional threats are those age-old threats which are, you know, in the form of border security. For example, India has borders with uh, hostile nations such as Pakistan and China, right? So we need comprehensive border security management, right, for that. And that is very important for our national security. So it will be consisting of that. And finally, we'll also have seen external aggression in the form, in form of, say, wars that we have fought against Pakistan and China. So these are all external aggressions. And the national security agenda and the national security strategy must be, uh, you know, encapsulating these traditional threats because these are still the issues that India is facing in this 21st century. The next is about the non-traditional threats and the very first non-traditional threat is the uh, menace of terrorism and also the state sponsored terrorism that comes in from Pakistan. So the terrorism agenda is very, uh, you know, priority agenda for this national security. Then we have other forms of non-traditional threats such as financial and economic stability. For example, if we imagine the stock markets in India if they fall prey to cyber attacks, if they fall prey to terrorists, they will be crippling, right? The entire economic structure of India, entire financial structure of India, and not only India, of Asia and also all over the world because, you know, India is one of the top five, you know, uh, size of economies around the whole world. So we can understand this. Next, uh, other threats will be coming from food and energy security objectives because, you know, Ensuring food and energy security for the overall nation is not only crucially from a policy making aspect but also from a military aspect because we need to protect this kind of food and energy security, financial and economic stability from the external aggressions. Then there is also right now a rise in information warfare. Generally on the cyber medium in the form of fake news, in the form of deep fakes, in the form of manipulating artificial intelligence. So we have various informational warfare where the true information is actually manipulated and it is being circulated on the social media or it is circulated on the wide over internet to manipulate a certain you know base or a certain amount of population. So this can also result in violence and riots and communal disharmony. So it is very important for the nation to you know aspect this and there is also vulnerabilities in the India's critical information infrastructure. For example, we have digital payments such as the UPI. We have the internet, which is, you know, penetrating each and every urban and rural areas. But we need to be aware that these, these are critical infrastructure because these uh, services, you know, actually keep the economy driving. And that is why we need to keep them safe. And that is why the defense establishment, the security agenda must be encapsulating these things. And finally, the supply chains, that the supply chains of Indian exports and also the environmental aspects of, you know, Indian, uh, you know, policy making, they must be also be factored into this. So here we have to understand that all these traditional and non-traditional threats must be taken into consideration and all this also provide us some opportunity because you know India is poised to be in the top three world economies within the next 20 to 30 years so that is why India has a huge economic potential and economics and defense must go hand in hand and that is why economic potential is a very very crucial pillar of this strategy Next, we must understand, we have various regional partners. For example, we have uh, Nepal, we have Bhutan, Bangladesh. In the extended neighborhood, we have the Asian nations who rely on India and also we rely on them. So we can understand if we militarily, if we can be strong in, ca uh, in case of our defense, we can also extend support to them and we can also extend our sphere of influence over them. And this is very important. Why? Because in our backward, there is this China who is trying to increase its tentacles around these nations. And India must be aware of this fact. And that is why India is also thinking of this. And finally, we have to understand India has a soft power of its 
cultural heritage of the various aspects such as Indian films, music. So it is also very important to protect these also. And also we must understand soft power can also be protected via these national security strategy because we have to understand you know being a defensive minded country being a country who has a national security agenda in mind and also a country which is culturally rich and has a rich past and heritage they must go hand in hand and finally you have to understand all these things are nothing without the institutions that run defense in India, right? The very first is this National Security Council and its secretariat. So there must be a harmony between all these three institutions. That is the National Security Council secretariat. Then there is this Ministry of Defense, which will be looking after the coordination of all the armed forces and also about the various budgets that these armed forces will be taking in. And finally, also the intelligence agencies because a national strategy must be encapsulating all of the institutions and must be harmonizing them. So that is why these institutions must also be accountable. Now here, the critical discussion here is that India so far does not have a national security strategy which is out there in the public domain. But there are other countries which have it. The US, the UK, Russia, they have it. China has its, you know, comprehensive national security which is very closely also linked to its governance structure. That means for China, defense and governance goes hand in hand. It can be that for governance purpose, they put emphasis on defense and vice versa too. So we have to understand for a country like China, their governance is a part of defense and defense is a part of governance. For Pakistan, they also have a national security policy 2022 to 2026. So we have to understand that India, while they have seen that all of the nations almost developed and developing countries, they have their national security uh, agenda. Why India does not have so far? Because we have to understand, you know, India did attempt at various times to have a national security strategy. But those three attempts so far have been paused due to political considerations because we have to understand such a strategy at a national level will be requiring the coordination of bureaucracy, of polity, of various you know, public officials at a very large scale. So the trust building has to be very, very strong. And also the military establishment have been kind of hesitant of this overall strategy at various point of time. Then the security experts in India say that accountability in the National Security Council Secretariat, in the Ministry of Defense, in the various intelligence agencies. We have to understand accountability in defense. That means we have to in disclose the information from the defense into the public domain. These were not been welcomed in India for a long, long period of time. And according to experts, this will be no, bring defense management to the government in public domain. So this was a very big hiccup. And also there are varying views in the strategic community that there is a lack of whole of government approach. The government is very reluctant to do this. And also, you know, making any defense aspect public is a very big no-no for the traditional governments. So that is what we have to understand here. And here, the thing is that when this national security strategy will be disclosed in the public, it is still uncertain because it has been not been known as of now. But the thing is that we India definitely need it right now. The very first reason is that most of the countries do have that. Second is that there are the complex nature of threats now, we have to understand that it is evolving starting from biological weapons, starting from cyber warfare, informational, uh, you, know, uh, you know, war, Terrorism, these are all the non-conventional threats which are on the rise. That is why India do need a convergent national security strategy on these lines. Next, we see that the geopolitical scenario all around us, for example, so the, the, the Russia-Ukraine crisis is still going on. The Israel-Palestine crisis is now you know, emergent and these have ripple effects across the entire geopolitical scenario in the entire world. So we have to understand that in this world of geopolitical uncertainty, 
right we need this kind of nss and there is a no concrete document in india to guide our armed forces the only thing that we have is the 2009 raksha mantri's operational directive which gives some of the political direction only to the armed forces we do not have a convergent all india level all government level all military political socio economic level uh, advisory to the armed forces and here this is also very dated because it was released in 2009 it is quite old right now because we can understand the non traditional threats are emergent every day and it has evolved from 2009 levels and finally the experts they say also that major military reforms can only follow if we have a national security strategy in place if we have a document that delineates that these are the threats we have and these are the reforms that we need to take place that will be only possible if there is an nss in place so it is a need of the time right now and it is also the government of the day that will be soon releasing its national strategy uh, you know security strategy so this was all for this article the next article is about the visit of the bhutan's king into india because the king of bhutan jigme kesar namgyal right he visits india on sunday yesterday at a time when bhutan is engaged in crucial border talks with china and these developments have led to rising of eyebrows in new delhi circles because we have to understand india and bhutan are very very close allies are very very close partners and why this is important because in gs2 we have to study about india and its neighborhood so that is why we need to understand this particular development now here before going on to the details we have to talk about china a little now see china and bhutan they go hand in hand because they are just immediate partners and also they are recently you know warming up to each other now china is claiming almost all of the indian borders with china right the northern border the eastern border the middle sector borders so china has claims on almost all of these points and also it has a same thing with bhutan now what it says it says that the areas in bhutan such as the doklam such as the jakarlang such as the pasamlang and the sat king wildlife sanctuary these are uh, sanctuary these are all the parts of china and that is why it is constantly trying to negotiate and renegotiate and also at times going into aggression against bhutan and also against india at various points of their time because on a very big level it claims that china is you know claiming this entire south tibet which also includes a part of our you know arunachal pradesh and bhutan so it is claiming that these are the parts of south tibet and let me tell you this is not the only place where china is having this kind of irrelevant claims china is also claiming some parts of south china sea by uh, so you know china is also trying to claim some parts of east china sea so these are all a uh, very well calibrated plan of china to be in an aggressive equilibrium with its neighbors because china knows that it cannot exist peacefully with its neighbors because it is a very big economic power and it has huge aspirations and these aspirations cannot be coexisting with rising nations also like india because they are competitors so china being competitors they have realized that they will be aggressive and it is a aggressiveness will be which will be, which is an equilibrium so we have to understand this is the agent of china and china also knows that if it pressure tactics work in bhutan it will be indirectly also you know pressurizing india right so china has this overall huge you know amount of military and strategic implication in mind now here the ties between bhutan and china during 2017 and 21 were not too much of friendly because in 2017 the doklam crisis took place where the chinese tried to occupy some of the places in doklam which is a remote area of you know this border between sikkim and bhutan and also china so they are in this tri junction border now here we have to understand that for almost 6 to 7 years this you know thaw in this friendship between or say relationship between bhutan and china took place after that 
from 2001 onwards, they, Bhutan and China, they announced a three-step road, road map where they agreed, they agreed in principle that they will be sitting together to resolve all of these issues regarding their borders. So, India were very concerned back in 2021 when they, Bhutan and China, they actually sat together to agree that they will be settled borders because India and Bhutan are very close partners and Bhutan relies on India for various economic, uh, you know, strategic, energy security needs, right? So, India was very concerned. Then, recently, they, these two countries also held the 25th round of bilateral border talks in Beijing. Right? And here, their Bhutanese foreign minister, right, Tanri Dorji, he said that Bhutan sincerely is seeking a quick settlement of the border dispute. Right? It is aiming for a quick settlement. Then, it is also establishing diplomatic relations with China at the earliest possible. Now, these two have seriously, uh, you, know, you know, raised eyebrows at New Delhi because Bhutan is seeking quick and you know responsive relationship with China and what Bhutan tends to gain with it because it tends to gain a P5 member country who will be you know friendly with them. P5 member country is China here. So the P5 member country which is China if it sides with Bhutan right it will be at their own advantage. Then it also aims that the economic dependence and the energy security dependence that Bhutan has on India, they cannot diversify. Now Bhutan is now trying to diversify its partnership away from India right now. And this is very, you know, a cause of concern for India. And if we look at Indian concerns, why India is very concerned? We have the following reasons that China is trying to get a foothold in Bhutan right now. So, apart from getting a foothold in Pakistan, in Nepal, and also it is trying to do the same with Myanmar and Bangladesh and Sri Lanka, it is now doing the same thing with Bhutan, right? It is very concerned, India is very concerned that it Bhutan can give away the access or even control of the Doklam Plateau to China. And then China will be coming to a very close periphery to this chicken, chicken neck corridor which is in the you know Shiliguri area of West Bengal right we can understand this area is very very narrow it is as narrow as 21 to 22 kilometer right and if China comes close to this area that is as close as Sikkim then it will be causing a security pandemic right then we have to understand the speed at which China is negotiating with Bhutan. That is also very dangerous. And also the scholars and analysts in China, they're celebrating this. They're celebrating this 25 bilateral talks. They're celebrating the vigor with which China has dominated the Bhutan border talks here. So they are saying that this is a diplomatic breakthrough. And when they are celebrating, Indians must be worried. Indian policymakers must be definitely be worried. Now here, India, what uh, you know, India must do is watch and act, is watch what the border talks are going on and they must be acting swiftly because in the past, the Bhutanese, you know, king and the, also their political establishment, they have told, they have deliberately told that theoretically, how can Bhutan not have any bilateral relations with China? The question is when and in what manner. Remember that this is coming from Bhutan. This statement is coming from Bhutan. And we have to understand also the recent developments that they are speeding up the processes of bilateral ties with China. So they definitely are in the mood of doing so. And here India must be concerned because of the very strategic and military significance here. And here, how can India be, you know, the solving this situation first is addressing the issues that india has with China, you know bhutan first is the hydropower issues most of the hydropower say dams the power plants that india has built in bhutan are to india's favor india has more in favor than bhutan over these projects and this has built a strong public outrage in bhutan also so India must be trying to balance this kind of outrage. 
they must be sitting to negotiate these hydropower projects. And when we look at trade, more than 80% of the trade is tilted in form of India. We can also understand, right, because Bhutan is almost dependent on India on all its imports and all its various economic and domestic needs. So what India can do is, India can encourage its private uh, companies to set up firms in Bhutan to manufacture their domestically. It can be also good for India and Bhutan too. So India can encourage more and more private uh, investments in Bhutan. And finally, we must understand that it is a talk of regional leadership and partnership. That is why the two leaders must be sitting together and discussing these things. And finally, the communication is very important. India must not be remaining silent if it is wanting to be a Vishwaguru in the new age, in the Amrit Kal that is being ushered by 2047. It must be ensuring communication dialogues. It must be properly communicating what India is trying to achieve. And it must be properly communicating the same to Bhutan. And Bhutan is expected also to do the same here. Moving on to the next one, we find a very major you know, uh, political part in India, it is giving SOPs for farmers, of SOP means free services, free goods for farmers, free electricity, cooking gas, subsidy, which are featuring in the Chhattisgarh manifesto of that political party. And why this is very important? Because we need to study a particular term known as freebie, because these are the free goods and services that are provided by the political parties in their manifesto before going into the elections and also sometimes after the elections to actually woo or to attract the voters in their favor. Now, in GS2, we have various welfare schemes for their vulnerable sections of the population by both the center and the states and the performance of these schemes. So it is directly to do this. And finally, in GS3, we have government budgeting. We need to also understand how government budgets are directly and indirectly affected due to various welfare schemes and their performance. That is why we need to study these freebies. Now see, before going into details, let us understand some of the basic that, you know, the government collects taxes from us. Why? Because government needs to provide us with schools, roads, colleges, right? And also various infrastructural activities such as airports, ports, and also various other, you know, uh, such as free rations. So all of these services which are being provided by the government uh, come at a price for the government also. The government generally typically spend it via taxes or via say raising loans from the public. Here, we have to understand that these public goods are generally or of two types, right? The welfare state that is also enshrined in our directive principle of state policies, the DPSPs as popularly known as. So they generally have two kinds of public provisions. First are which are known as public goods or merit goods. These are what? These are say roads. These are say free education. These are say rations, which are given to the people to enhance their capability. According to Amartya Sen, capability is that inherent capacity in you to be productive in the future. You need good food, you need shelter, you need clothing, you need proper government facilities to be capable to be productive economically. So that is why there, is, there are these merit goods such as this, which will be boosting your productivity in the long run. Then there are these freebies. Freebies are say free electricity, free gas, farm, loan, waivers because these are all short term in nature by short term i mean that once you give them right you do not have the long term aspirations for example if a farmer has taken a loan indeed the farmer is always indebted in india you know because more than 80 to 85 percent of indian farmers are small and marginal farmers they are under huge debt but we have to understand that these farm loan waivers are one time they relieve their debt for one time, right? We have to understand the electricity, uh, you know, the free electricity up to around say 200 units in some of the states in India and also in union territories. So these are not building the capability of the people. If we offer free electricity, I understand that there will be, you know, 
it will be very good for the poorer classes because they cannot afford it but will it be building a good capability as good as say free education or relations no right now so these are the distinctions that we have to do between public goods and merit goods but there are some benefits of these free weeds also for example the sustainable development goals that we have in the form of no hunger no poverty right education sanitation sustainable cities reducing inequalities so we have to understand if we give free electricity if we give free gas and all this free say smartphones laptops these are actually helping the you know poorer classes to afford more and more goods and services that is definitely helping them and also allowing us to achieve our sustainable development goals then it is also reducing the inequalities because we have to understand that these services such as electricity gas are invariably available with the middle or say upper middle classes the richer classes but most often we do not see these in the homes and houses of various poorer classes so it is being reducing the inequalities and finally it is also fitting in with the overall you know upliftment of the poorest or the anto dia philosophy that indian policy makers always believe in right it is always the upliftment of the welfare people via provision of public services but the thing is that there are some questions there are some very serious questions that are arising with freebies that the freebies the time the date the reason why they are given right or are there any strings attached to it are there any condition it is that a election is coming up or a political party desperately needs to win and that's why they are giving these services are or is this is the reason for that then who are the beneficiaries are the beneficiaries only the poor people or is it available for all for example in some states the free electricity which is given is actually for all for everyone who is consuming up to say 200 units of electricity their electricity bill will not come but here even the rich people even the middle income people right even the poor people they are being treated the same here this should not be the case right then can they afford themselves for example say again the same question is coming if this beneficiaries if you are giving to all right so the even the rich can afford this but they are still taking the benefit and finally are the democratic or say it is being announced by a very big major party can the small parties can the regional parties can the independent candidates can they promise this in their manifestos and if they are not being able to promise are they being uh, you know left behind due to the money and uh, you know various financial powers that very big political parties have so this is tilting the game in their favor right so apart from this there are also some other issues too in the s subramaniam balaji case of 2013 the supreme court observed that the unrealistic poll promises and freebies disturb the level playing field in elections as we have said that these are not democratic because not all political parties can afford that not all political candidates can afford to give these promises right then the 14 finance commission it's observed that the state government's financial position and the fiscal in discipline is very rampant in india as of now if we can compare here the state of punjab sees its freebies or say the percentages that they spend on freebies is around 2.7% of gross state domestic product right we have to understand the various tax receipts is also a part of around 17.8% right so we have to understand this states of punjab andhra pradesh jharkhand who have given a lot of freebies to its people they are facing the burden of debt right now right so that is the thing and even rbi says that you know the states with highest uh, subsidy burden is punjab rajasthan kerala west bengal and bihar the expenditure on freebies is around 0. or 1% to around 2.7% of gross state domestic product of various states this is a very big concern because the state governments do not have often enough funds to run their own operations to run or say spend on infrastructure and they spend on these freebies 
before coming to elections they promise this and after elections they are facing this debt now this is a very big conundrum then this also breeds a culture of dependency or say if you are giving free smartphone and laptops to a certain bunch of population they become dependent on that political party that the next time also when the voting all the when the elections will be there they will be voting for them again so this is creating a culture of quid pro quo right then we have to understand by giving freebies we are shifting our priorities from the long term to the short term because other than giving say free electricity we can build a solar power plant which can give free electricity after a long period of time say after say 5 years 6 years so the government must be funding this clean energy projects which will be having huge benefits right not only say reducing the cost but also good for the environment so we can we have to understand that giving free electricity right now is compromising the long term targets that we have we also have the panchamrit right to have a net zero by 2070 so we have to understand that all these things are kind of interrelated and the long term goals suffer then the diversion of policy debates from say various civil society organizations and even the intellectual uh, class they are being diverted if they are given some freebies right also there are some various important discussions that go on before elections if you give freebies the entire discussion gets diverted only to freebies and the other important aspects the other important debates they become left back and finally it also increases corruption because giving services and goods and services first they create a culture of dependency and when you depend on the government you also become dependent on the public officials and public officials when they have to offer freebies, they can, they can in, uh, you know, uh, in, engage in corruption. So that is also a very, very important thing that it increases corruption in this aspect. Finally, we have to understand that right now the election season is on. The 2024 elections is in the next year. And also various state governments are going to poll right now. So the political parties must be restraining, must be restraining on their part to not give freebies, right? The role of the opposition is very important here that the opposition must be campaigning against these freebies. The CAG must be auditing the state governments in a very rigorous manner to find out the schemes that are in the nature of freebies because they put strain ultimately on the central government only right because the central government later have to give funds and the long-term projects such as the roads schools infrastructure they are left behind and also the election commission of india they must be seeking they must be seeking uh, you know directives from the political parties and they must be directly coordinating with political parties to reduce the scope of these freebies and we have to understand that we must also try to revisit the seventh schedule of our constitution where we have employment food and education and these are the areas in which the state governments give the maximum amount of freebies so there is a need to revisit the seventh schedule of our constitution and also the FRBM Act which is trying to put in a fiscal discipline in India. So we have to also revisit the targets that are set in the FRBM Act. We should try to put some limits right and then only we will be having some discipline on the uh, issue of freebies. And we have to always understand that merit goods are in any day better than freebie. So let this be in the policy discussion always for the spirit of the discussion. Next, we will be looking at the Commission for Air Quality Management because in New Delhi, right now, a stricter GRAP is now being applicable throughout the NCR. And as per the guidelines set forth by the Commission for Air Quality Management in NCR and adjoining regions, this GRAP revised GRAP has been framed now this is important for prelims examination because issues on environment is very very important now see this CAQM was actually set up by uh, you know the central government initially via an ordinance that was passed in 2020 later by an act of parliament by 2021 and here this is actually to look at the air quality because 
the government was finding it very difficult to control the air quality standards using various uh, you know laws you know using various bodies in the new delhi region so it thought of creating one single body to totally replace all other laws bodies and whatsoever with reference to only air pollution to improve the quality of air in the new delhi region especially during this time of say uh, diwali and winters so here it set up this CAQM for NCR and the adjoining areas. The adjoining areas will be Haryana, Punjab, Rajasthan and Uttar Pradesh. For what? For better coordination of air pollution standards, for research into the reasons and causes and also the solutions of this air pollution, for identification of the particular areas in which the air pollution is very very severe and also the resolution of problems with ref reference to the air quality index. So it will be setting up its all benchmark, it will be setting if all its advisory guidelines with reference to the AQI which is by the Central Pollution Control Board. So it will be monitoring the air quality index in the NCR region. Now it replaced the Supreme Court appointed Environment Pollution Prevention and Control Authority that was you know appointed by the Supreme Court earlier because here this EPCA totally failed to improve the you know air quality. So as of now the powers that the CAQM have that all the rulings that is by the uh, CAQM in the matters of air pollution and law is of the highest quality right they will be superseding any law any air pollution law or any body in that matter even if it is the case with the state pollution control board or even with the national pollution control board right it will be superseding all of the rulings then it will be ensuring the state coordination between you know the government of delhi haryana punjab rajasthan and up it will be coordinating the you know various reasons of air pollution the vehicular pollution the stubble burning issues that uh, you know these governments have between themselves and finally delhi is being affected due to these so it will be coordinating with reference to industries it can restrict an industry it can inspect and it can also close any industry if it founds if it finds that it is polluting in nature and finally it is also responsible with enacting the grap or the graded response action plan now graded response action plan will be starting with stage one stage one is when your air quality is very poor or say poor it is having this aqi quality of around say 200 to 300 please note that you did not you need not say remember the exact numbers here right or exact categories or all the different items here you have to understand how this actually works now this is actually the grap as far the 2000 21 to 2022 so here the stage one is dealing with poor air quality the stage two is very poor stage three is severe and stage four is very severe severe plus so we can understand if we study the various components in the very first stage you know some uh, polluting activities are being prohibited such as say you cannot use diesel uh, diesel generators because diesel generators uh, say uh, you know involve a lot of pollution in case of say regular source of power supply so that is being prohibited now the same thing in the second stage banning is totally banned right it is about banning diesel generator right except some essential services but in the first stage we have to understand it is kind of prohibiting second it is totally banning third stage it is also banning some other activities right it is regulating the industries in ncr right it is trying to ban on cnd activities in ncr right it is trying to you know shutting down brick kings because they emit a lot of uh, pollution it is banning mining and so on and finally the stage four is a penalty mat it is trying to stop the entry of trucks right in the ncr region except the essential supplies then it is uh, you know totally banning the diesel run medium and heavy goods vehicles because diesel uh, is uh, emitting a lot of pollution then all of the other things so it is just a stage wise first it is stage one then two then three then four it is actually going in this manner so right now the caqm is also using this grap to control the air pollution right 
So this was all in this thing. Now in the next and final one, we are seeing this issue of rising prices of onions. Because in most metro cities, the onion prices have touched the 80 rupees kilo and it is also further expected to be rising in the near future. This is important. Why? Because again in prelims, we have economic and social development. Here, we will be looking at some of the reasons why this price rise is happening, right? See, before that we also understand to, uh, we also need to understand the main harvest seasons for onions in India. The very first is Kharif season, right? And it is harvested after October. So right now we can understand it is after October right now. So the onions will be harvested right now. Then it is also the late Kharif season when it is cultivated, right? And it is harvested in December. And Rabi, it is harvested after March. So let us be very, you know, particular with the harvesting months of, uh, you know, uh, onions. That is late October or after October, December and March. Now onion is a perishable item because it has a lot of water moisture content in it. So that is why it is, you know, seeing the rise in prices. Next, there were unseasonal rains and hailstorm in March. And let us remember that it was the harvesting time of Ravi crop of onion during March. So in 2023 March, there were heavy rains and hailstorm. And that is why most of the crops were destroyed during that time. Next, we have delayed monsoon. And the delayed monsoon actually delayed the Kharif, right? And the late Kharif harvesting of crops. So again, this is reducing the supply of onions. Then again, Bangladesh also saw a huge demand for Indian onions and we exported excess of onions to Bangladesh. Again, decrease in supply. Then traders are also taking this advantage of situation of all the things discussed above. Traders are saying that these are the things that happened. So let us also raise the prices. How we will be raise the prices by artificially or say reducing the supply. Now this is a speculation. This is not a formal reason, but this is also taking place. Now the government also took some steps generally in the export sector. They uh, in August uh, imposed an export duty. In October they imposed a minimum export price, right? But the same thing was not resonated. And it was not resonated by the Lasal Gao wholesale market, which is the largest onion market in India, right? Whatever the prices that Lasal Gao market generally sets is generally maintained in the rest of the country. But it has not been resonating the government's approach. So that is why the prices are rising and it is also expected to rise in the near future. That is all for discussion today. I thank you very much for your patience and I hope you all the very best. Till the next time, thank you.